All right, well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Erin Maney. I'm the Manager of Communications and Community Engagement for SUNY. In partnership with SUNY's FACT2 Task Group on Open Pedagogy and our Conference on Instructional Technology, I want to welcome you to today's Open Education Week webinar. If you could type in the chat, let us know where you are tuning in from. That would be awesome. So we could get to know you a little bit as well. So today we are pleased to host Talia Lipton from Rockland Community College. Talia is an instructor of speech and her leadership has enabled RCC's Open Educational Resources Initiative to receive a SUNY IITG grant for the establishment of an OER repository. Talia is joined by Ryan Hersha from Corning Community College. Ryan is an associate professor of English. He leads the charge on his campus to transition from traditional costly textbooks to open source textbooks. On behalf of SUNY's Community of Practice, I want to thank you both for joining us and sharing what you know about open pedagogy and OER. So I will turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And Ryan and I are really excited about this project. And we are excited to share with you uh, the who, the what, the why, the how, and where we are at now. We have lots of questions, and we would love a conversation going. So if you have any questions during the presentation, just type them out and Aaron will moderate and mediate and we, we are, are good to have a conversation. There's not that many of you who logged in, so it's nice and intimate. So Ryan, if you could advance the slide. So the who, uh, Ryan, I'll let you introduce yourself, obviously. Hi everyone, uh, I was already introduced a little bit. Um, just excited to be part of this project and uh, have a discussion with you. Okay, and the other two professors that are on this project are very dedicated adjunct professors at Rockland, um, Nancy Rosen and Maria Sanfilippo, and they agreed to be a part of this project as well. And so as you can see, this was, uh, this represented the section that we did in the fall semester, so fall 2019. And so there was a total of, uh, what do we have, 230 students between our two campuses, which is a nice amount. And it, uh, you know, there's, that's a nice amount of students who have contributed. So Ryan and I are both full-time faculty members and Nancy and Maria are adjuncts. So, slide. So the why. Uh, we are both very passionate about open educational resources. Ryan and I had met about three years ago at a CIT conference, uh, one of those where we were kind of migrating from OER uh, to OER, all of the all of the presentations and we had met and we had started a conversation and then last year or two years ago when Ryan was presenting we just got into a conversation about doing a project together and we both were talking about how one and we both use the same textbook and we were both talking about some barriers to having our colleagues adopt the textbook was that there was no test bank and so we you know we wanted to uh, contribute to the open educational resource community by doing this. What do you think, Ryan? Um, and so this is the textbook that we both have been using independently. We, you know, this was not something that we, we decided on together. We had both been using this independently and we both found that this was a pretty decent textbook. Uh, we both use additional resources on our own. I know Ryan has created his own. I create my own. I also use a textbook called Communication in the Real World, another open educational resource. Uh, but this one was, a, we had to start with one. We couldn't start with both. I don't know, Ryan, is there a reason that you particularly chose this book? Uh, just based on my review, it, it seemed to hit the concepts in as clear a way as possible uh, for me. Um, uh, I, I like the textbook, but like you and probably like virtually all other faculty members, you know, I, I uh, steal from here and there and, um, and, and, and make it work. Um, and of course, the, the textbook has changed in my class a little bit, uh, semester to semester, if st if students have played a role in, uh, in editing it as well. Right, I, I forgot. I remember a, attending that that uh, presentation that you gave with the students who were. I forgot where we were though. <laughs> it all kind of is. <laughs> but I remember being very impressed with what how you were using the textbook and how the students were a part of 
you know, looking for holes in the textbook and filling those, the, what was missing in their eyes. So that was great. So if you could advance the slide. So in, on the Rockland campus, the course that we, I use this textbook in is Speech 101, which is Fundamentals of Communication, otherwise known as the public speaking course at Rockland. Yeah, and we basically have the same course at Corning. Exactly. So the process. We all approached it in a very different way. However, what was similar is we all collaborated, the four of us collaborated on a handbook uh, during the summer of 2019 because we recognized we wanted some uniformity, uniformity to, to what we were, how we were addressing this. And so we came up with uh, this guidebook that described basically very briefly what OER is, why we wanted to contribute to the movement, and we also talked about the process of developing different types of questions, such as true and false, multiple choice, short answer questions. And we gave the students a type of a guidebook, but it wasn't all encompassing by any means, but it was, I, I believe, pretty user friendly. And the students have responded well to it, at least in my case, they told me that with the guidebook was very, very helpful to them. So I'll tell you about the way I approached it and the way the other two adjuncts approached this project. And then Ryan, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to discuss your uh, process. Sure. So the way I approached it was I was teaching a, a, several sections last semester. So I gave them a group project. I set them up in groups of four and five students and then I gave them this project. And I said the deliverable is X amount of questions. I believe it was 25 questions and a combination of true, false, multiple choice, fill in the blank and short answer. And I allowed them to just go ahead and go for it. And I wanted to see what happened. I didn't want to give too much direction because I wanted to see their process. And what I did was I allowed, I, I had two due dates. I had a, a hard due date and a softer due date. If they got their, their questions in before the hard due date, for the hard deadline rather, I gave them some feedback in order for them to get a better you know, grade because this was a graded assignment. It was worth, it wasn't worth that much toward their final grade, but it was, you know, it was something that they still had to earn toward their final grade. And so I had about 80% of the students who submitted before the hard deadline and that was great. So I was able to give them a little bit of feedback and then, but I had 100% participation in this project, which was really great. Uh, it was also wonderful because each team had a team leader, so it gave students some leadership experience. It gave them experience. Some of them had never used Google Docs and that technology, so that was really great for some of the students. Did I ask for a certain level of difficulty, such as Bloom's taxonomy? Um, no, actually, no. We Well, yes and no. We put in the guidebook that there are different levels, but we didn't go so far as to go to Bloom's and 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 at least I did it. I don't know about Ryan. I don't know if you did. Uh, this was the first time we were doing it. And but that's a very good suggestion to as we move forward with this. And um, so then my process was very similar to Nancy Rosen's, but Maria did it a bit differently. I was teaching the one on one classes three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So Maria was teaching a class one time a week at night. She required them to submit weekly, the questions weekly, and she combined it with what information she was teaching, covering in class, which is really pedagogically, I think a much better way to do it. I just couldn't wrap my head around doing it because I was teaching the three 101s and then I was also teaching six other classes. So I, I, I really appreciate Maria's way better but I just didn't think I could do it or, and be organized. So I might look at, to try to do it that way this semester, I'm not sure. So uh, in my classes, they each, well, all of us had the students sign waivers. Um, and so they understood that like, I signed a way, you know, I signed a contract with them. We signed contracts and they signed a waiver to uh, allow us to use their name, to give them attribution if their group's questions were chosen. And in terms of the verbs, I think that's a great idea. I think that's a wonderful idea. And actually that's something I'm going, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> I'm going, we could add that to maybe the guidebook this semester because I haven't started mine yet. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else. The students were excited to hear that they might get attribution if their questions were chosen. 
And so far, so good. I mean, one semester down, it started, it, it was a good start. Let's put it that way. Ryan, I don't know if you want to. Sure, yeah. Um, let me see. I'm going to skip ahead here to, uh, to my process here. Um, well, this is a very interesting project for me because uh, it, well, on the, on the one hand, it's collaborative uh, between faculty and between campuses. And, um, and so we're sharing resources and we're sharing uh, product that the outcome of, of the resources uh, or of the of our individual processes, but our, it's up to us how we actually get from point A to point B. And even with the resources, you know, we, we might change them up for our specific classes. And that's what I did. And so uh, I really appreciate all the work that especially Talia put in, in terms of, um, and, and the others at Rockland in terms of uh, getting the, uh, making sure the students are prepared to contribute. And I don't know if this is gonna work like this. Okay. And I see my browser, my, should be opening up on Google Doc. Yep, it's loading. Okay. So this is uh, my application. As you can see, this is, has a lot of information. It even talks about, you know, what are open educational resources? Uh, what's the what's the goal uh, for your, your team? I did have, in the, the first semester, I had uh, students work in teams, um, which is great. Also, uh, you know, anytime you have students work in groups, there's going to be challenges about that, <laughs> and we have to be very deliberate on how make that uh, collaborative aspect of the course. Uh, and there, were, you know, there were conflicts uh, in my first time in terms of you know students uh, having disagreements about you know who is responsible for what, um, which is, I, in my experience, pretty typical with with group work. Um, that said, that's not to say it's not worth the uh, the collaborative component. Um, here, you can get a sense for the kinds of work that my first time students did and, and according to what schedule. Uh, first step was to actually just to uh, assign students to their various groups. Um, I assigned students to develop their own draft questions individually, um, and then they would share that with their team members. Um, I required that they have a meeting like this, have a web meeting, even though it's, it's a, it was a hybrid class. Um, I required them to, uh, to to meet online and to discuss it online because it was important for me that students develop that skill. Um, had to conduct a web meeting, uh, and then they also had to elect somebody to actually share the the questions via a form that I made up. Uh, and um, and I also asked them to complete an end of project reflection. Now, my first semester, because there was so much attention on my part in terms of the collaborative aspect to it. A lot of the reflection was focused on the, you know, how, what did you learn about working with other people, et cetera, things like that. Um, where this guide that uh, Talia drew up was really helpful for me um, was giving students uh, guidance in terms of attribution. Um, and then this part right here, designing effective test questions. One of the things that I, I've never asked students to write test questions before, partly because it's not typical for me to have a whole lot of tests or quizzes in my classes. There's, you know, I'm, a, I'm an English instructor and public speaking instructor. And uh, so a lot of that is, is uh, you know, essays and speeches. Uh, but I learned from seeing students work that on developing test questions, just how difficult it is actually to write a good test question and how many different uh, things you have to think about uh, when designing what might seem like a, a straightforward um, assessment of, of comprehension for a chapter. And uh, so, but that said, these starting principles, I think, were, were very helpful. Um, and uh, I really appreciate Talia drawing that up for me, for, uh, for all of us. Uh, so that's how I did it the first time. And we, the, the product of that was that, you know, students did generate a lot of questions. Um, they were uh, in my view, kind of uneven in terms of their, their usability. And one of the things we're gonna have to figure out as a group, um, talking about Talia, you know, the whole group uh, of faculty working on this is what's gonna be our process for assessing the questions and choosing the, the questions that are gonna um, play into it. As I'm looking at what I'm doing this coming, 
this semester, this current semester, um, trying to get back to the presentation here. Let's see. Uh, without ruining everything here. Um, uh, one of the things that I'd like to do is actually involve students in, I think beta testing might be the wrong word, <laughs> maybe gamma testing, delta testing, but uh, having students play a role in actually assessing uh, the quality of, of one another's questions, um, not just on the small group level, but on the, on the larger level and, and asking questions or, and actually thinking about what makes for, um, you know, a good assessment of comprehension uh, for, for this specific concept. Um, so that's how it worked for me. I want to just add one thing. We had decided mm -hmm. on the same five chapters that we all focused on, and we decided mm -hmm. on the next five chapters for this semester that we're all focusing on this way. We looked at this as a two-year project to try to get the entire textbook in, we were talking, you know, after the test bank, we, you know, maybe we'd move on to other ancillaries such as PowerPoints and, you know, class activities. We, you know, we were just, you know, discussing all of these ideas. But I, uh, what I like when the fact that we all focus on the same chapters was that we, we do have, like I said, we do have a, a lot of questions to sift through and edit and peer review for each other. But hopefully we'll get a nice amount of questions that are usable and or ones that we could edit lightly and, and use. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Can you go back to a couple slides? Okay, no, I think we're on the technology. Yep. Okay, so the technology that I use and I know that Nancy and Marie use was Google Docs. So that being said, it worked out well. They were able to share. My, cl my classes were all face-to-face, -face, so were Nancy's and so were, were Maria's. So we didn't have that hybrid component. So we were all able to build in a bit of class time for them. Being in a community college, it's just super challenging to have students meet outside of class time. In a lot of cases, so many of them have work schedules and other constraints on their time. So we are, I'm always very aware of that when I do group projects and it really didn't take much time to organize in the class, believe it or not, because they were able to use this technology. And a lot of them said that they collaborated at night together and it was a really, it was really great. And what another benefit, like I said before, as I mentioned, was that some of them had never used this technology. They've never collaborated on the docs. And so that was a great, side bonus for me for students to be able to use this technology. Absolutely. And just so everyone knows, uh, the first semester, uh, one of my sections was fully online. Uh, yeah. And I really saw no differences uh, because the, the work that they did uh, was mostly out of, outside of class anyway. I didn't really see any difference in terms of the, uh, the uh, success that students had with the project. And oh, just, I'm sorry, just on the, the topic of technology, I did a little bit, I'm, as I listen to Tally, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe I should steal her idea, but uh, I actually developed forms for students to submit their questions. Mm -hmm. And then it was on me to kind of, you know, put it all together. I like the idea of having them draw on them themselves though. Yeah, that's what's great about collaborating with you, Ryan, and also collaborating with two other faculty members at our process. Getting from A to B is very different we're all doing it differently, but sometimes I'll listen to an, an idea Ryan had or Maria or Nancy and I'll say, oh, next time I'll do it that way. And we have several more semesters to go. So mm -hmm. I'm absolutely open of changing and seeing, you know, maybe changing it up and seeing what happens. So the results of our first semester, we have hundreds of questions. Some are written, written very well, some not so much. <laughs> uh, you know, even basic, I've seen grammatical errors with some of them. I, I don't know if you've seen the same thing. But what was nice was, I think for me, I saw where the students, almost like where their mind was working when they were reading the information. And it was interesting because many of them focused on very similar themes of the chapters, which was interesting. So we have to do a deeper dive in analyzing the questions. We have not done that yet, full disclosure. We are 
both full time plus uh, working faculty. And it's uh, we we said that we're going to do this summer. We're going to really come up with the process of doing a much deeper dive into analyzing the questions we got we received and then compiling them of all four of us. And then also we'll also have five more chapters. So we'll have 10 chapters of the textbook. So we'll have quite the project in front of us. Are you there, Tally? I'm here. I'm just waiting for okay. you. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know what you want to hit on next. Um, I have, uh, they, this is kind of an irrelevant picture, but I wanted to show a pic <laughs> picture of students. Uh, this is at SUNY Corning during what we had open educational day uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, actually, a four student over on the left, she was actually, her name is Sarah Bogdan. She uh, uh, actually was an editor of our version of Stand Up, Speak Out. Um, and on, on a few chapters. So, uh, you know, it, well, Tally at the beginning was talking about our motivations. Um, and, that I, you know, I do think it, there, there will be value in having a high quality test bank or, uh, you know, questions, prompts that are embedded into the textbook. I, I think that'll make the textbook a lot better. Um, but for me, you know, it's, it, that's a fundamental value of open educational resources is uh, when they're licensed appropriately is that, you, you know, students can play a role in uh, making the textbook better. And of course, that just takes their learning, learning to, to new levels. And uh, there, it's obviously there's, there's cost of time and, and uh, that's associated with that. And it's not easy, uh, but uh, in my experience, it's, it's worth it. Um, so. And, and one, of the, one of the questions that I received I don't know if you received this, Ryan, is mm -hmm. what happens if we come up with this open source question bank and test bank and students get their hands on it? Well, my response to that is, and I'm, I'm very much in line with what Ryan said, the, the mid, I give one test in public, my public, public speaking classes, excuse me, because 80% of the course is they're assessed based on their presentation. So the midterm is just, you know, a way for me to get some content that I might not have time to cover, so it'll cover the readings. But if a student is willing to learn hundreds and hundreds of questions and answers, well, then I kind of win anyway. <laughs> so I don't see how it's a, a losing proposition because we're not talking about a test bank of 20 questions and that will be what we're choosing. We're talking about a very hefty lots of question test bank and all different kinds and like i said if a student is willing to find if they get their hands on it and they're and they're learning all of those questions and answers well that that's okay by me you know i don't i don't really have a problem with it yeah absolutely and it's just one other component of it that i would like to do, i would like to do better in terms of my process um but it speaks to the the outcomes and and what makes this worthwhile uh in terms of the actual process of developing the questions is I would like to deliberately schedule more time into my class for us to discuss as a class the questions. Mm -hmm. So use them as prompts for conversation, uh, not just to uh, assess the, the quality of the questions, but to get into the, the very concepts that they're talking about. Um, so, and, and potentially, you know, it, when the test bank is finally developed, I'm, I'm hoping that the questions are such that they can serve the same purpose. Yeah. And if they're developing them, you know where their attention is going uh, in the chapter. So that's an interesting thing to bring into the classroom. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. And, and no, go ahead. Go um, ahead. Tell me. I'm just reading the from Robin. She's writing. I accidentally I find faculty very resistant. Erin, could you read that? Hold on. What is it? Um, yeah, I found it. I got it. I find Faculty very resistant to learning about new technology. It's a struggle to get them to even consider adopting Google Docs. New tech can be so helpful. And I'm pulling my hair out. Uh, have you guys found faculty tech abilities conflict with OER adoption? I, you know, what I found is that some faculty uh, insist that the O in OER is online. <laughs> uh, they, and so some of the faculty members who were really resistant on our campus are using that as the excuse. I don't want it to be online. I want a textbook. I don't want it to be online. Uh, you know, not even 
like, like searching, like researching the options of print copies and all that. But yeah, of course, we have some faculty who are still fighting going on Blackboard on our campus. And we have some faculty who are leading the charge in creating, you know, using all of the functionality of Blackboard. So I guess I think that's probably on every campus. And right now, I've been working with faculty with OER at Rockland for at least three, four years now. And you, we're just not going to get everybody. And they, they might use technology is the reason it might just be something else but at this point i'm open to you know always having the conversation with faculty but i'm not going to so to speak pull my hair out if they want to use oh i can't use technology as you know a, a reason i don't know ryan what you sure. well, we've um had so sometimes departments as a whole will they want to agree on the same textbook and that's like it or not, that, that was the policy of our English department with respect to our freshman composition one textbook. And, uh, but uh, how we worked through that, and that included some people who were uh, far less comfortable with technology or using Blackboard or any, anything along those lines. And so the way that we did that was we uh, had some trial sections and then we measured the success in the trial sections. And then um, we ramped up to um, uh, adopt it throughout the, uh, across all sections uh, for a freshman composition one. What we did for those who were uncomfortable or, uh, you know, a little bit wary of going to the online textbook was we made sure that there was, there were print ver high quality print versions available. And so SUNY Press, oh, SUNY OER Services worked with SUNY Press and produced at a low cost uh, high quality textbooks um, based on the online resources. Of course, you're, you're missing hyperlinks, you're missing videos and whatnot, but uh, you can get a lot of the content in there. Um, and that's something you want to think about. And that's something we're, we're going to probably want to think about as we're, even as we're developing this test bank, it might seem pretty discreet, but for example, this question about how high stakes that the, these uh, questions are is going to be is going to matter. So for example, I, I do use a print version of the online of the open textbook, and um, but I don't require it. Uh, but if we are going to, and I think we are going to uh, create a version of the open textbook that includes these questions, is the print version going to have the answers at the end, <laughs> as as a kind of you know uh, low stakes way for students to, uh, you know, test their own uh, comprehension and as prompts for discussion, or are we going to have it separate, uh, and, you know, like in a teacher's uh, edition or something like that. And so uh, on the one hand, it might seem uh, like not a very important question, but if you're going to have print versions, you have to, you have to think that through, sure. especially if you're talking about faculty who are wary of adopting the online version. And um, Jamie asked, I found one faculty resistant saying, what's going to happen to the publishers? I had the same thing happen, Jamie, to, <laughs> uh, to me, um, without mentioning any names of who it was, uh, an older faculty member, not, I'm not trying to be ageist, but she's just set in her ways, very set in her ways, I, and I don't mean to be ageist at all. And she said, well, I feel bad for the authors of the textbook. And I said, well, I'm not really thinking about the authors of the textbook because they're probably, you know, doing pretty well for themselves in their day jobs. I said, I'm more concerned about my student who's food insecure, who cannot, you know, doesn't know where their next meal is coming from, or they're working 40, 50 hours to pay their electric bill and help their parents pay their rent. So I said, right now, that's, that's where I think my job lies, is to advocate for my students, not advocate for the authors of the textbook. And, you know, shame on the publishers for having it go this way, because this is th this was a direct result of, you know, publishers being really, really greedy and, you know, ramping up, pro you know, 800 percent textbook prices. That's just insane. So what about. Go ahead. I would say um, I was at the open ed conference last fall and they talked about the inclusive access is ramping up now. And so it, I'm at Delhi. And so I checked in with that in my college and they're trying to get that for two courses. And so they're bringing the price down from like 140 to like 90. Um, actually, they're 
it's taking years to get past SUNY where it's still going to be the same price. They want to add a fee. But I'm like, yes, it's cheaper, but it's still $90. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if they can bring inclusive access down, but then you might not have your resources forever. You know, that's mm -hmm. also an issue. Yeah, I mean, I think that the fact that OER, the movement, is, is making these publishers think to offer the material in a different way and cheaper, right, and more access, I think that's great. I think that we should really be proud of ourselves, all of us who are part of this discussion. So uh, I think that's great. Uh, in terms of where it's going to go, let's, keep, let's hope, I mean, if... Listen, if a publisher is willing to offer a textbook for a reasonable price, the same amount as, let's say, OER, a Lumen course would be in the future, you know, I have no problem with that as long as students can feel that they, or, or students have equity in, their, in, in having access to this material. But I also want to say, you know, publishers can't compete with this. They can't, they can't compete with yeah. students <laughs> taking leadership, taking ownership of their own learning, you know, in such a, such a granular, real way, you know, as, and students' names being in, you know, as, as authors, contributors to the textbook. Um, there's just, there, it's really unfair, you know, I, I'm sorry, publishers, but, you know, students <laughs> are going to be the, their, their best educators. Uh, and, and faculty in this role, you know, I think we have an important, uh, uh, and, and difficult job of facilitating that and making that work. Um, but, you know, uh, if, if uh, publishers can, can, can make it so that, that students uh, have such ownership over their learning, uh, more power to them. And we've seen the same thing too, where uh, as soon as we went big with our OER push at Corning, you know, uh, the sales reps were in our offices really making, you know, bottom of the barrel offers, you know, short term, of course, in terms of all sorts of uh, all sorts of uh, textbook offers, and uh, and they were so aggressive about it that students actually knew about it. They, they 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 actually set up tables, you know, in the in the classroom buildings, and so they would actually be engaging. It was actually kind of inspiring to see the publishers care so much about you know mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> students and faculty uh, getting an affordable deal. But anyway, I just want to add that there's it, cost is one thing, but uh, open pedagogy is a whole other thing. And that's empowering our students to see that they can create like test questions. Like they probably had no idea that they could create good questions that can be used in a class that are valid. You know, who knows how valid or reliable they are, right? But in time. Well, that's what's next. Right? That's what we're, okay. yeah, we are, that's what Ryan and I were discussing okay. how we have to come up with a, t a type of system where uh, we, were, we were just, you know, throwing some ideas out there that we each look at our own questions that we received from our students and that we, we do, we discard the ones that are clearly not going to make the cut and then, you know, have a running document. We'll use Google Docs ourselves so we can have a, a working document and, you know, peer review them. And we're, we're, we have to figure that part out. That's part of the big what's next. And I think we're both putting it off until the summer when we have a bit more time to breathe. Uh, and also, like I said uh, before, after we get more chapters done. So we'll have quite a few to go through. It'll, it will be an interesting summer project. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm trying to think, um, yeah, oh, and we also, I think Ryan, I think you brought this up in a conversation. Ryan was thinking about having students become editors as well. So bringing these questions back to the students to another semester and saying, hey, this, these are the questions we have, start editing. What do you think? And maybe we could bring in, I forgot who it was who suggested the verbs. I'm so sorry. Was it Robin? That was me. Oh, that was you, Jimmy. Okay, so, yeah. so maybe now incorporate Blooms and, and maybe even show them the Blooms taxonomy and, and how that works and giving them those verbs and say, hey, what do you think? Like, or do we have enough questions that analyze? Do we have enough questions that, you know, that, that are at that top, the higher level of thinking? So, you know, listen, we're open to suggestions. So please email me, whoever's on this call. I would love to hear your suggestions here. If you have questions, uh, we, we have questions about where will this ultimately be housed? I know Lumen is working on a Waymaker course for public speaking communication course. 
So they're going to be doing some things. Maybe I, I don't. I have no idea what technology will we use. So we have lots of we have more questions about what's next than we have answers. So please, if anybody has suggestions, by all means, share. We are open to it. Absolutely. Sally, I just want to add to. I know Robin made a comment in the chat, and this is something we've seen, uh, you know, too in SUNY that. It seems that sometimes faculty are a little bit of oblivious to, you know, how long students have to work to afford that, that, you know, however much dollar textbook, right? And yeah. one of the things that we've done is have faculty talk to faculty, right? So that those who are doing it and those who are seeing the impact of it with their students are sharing those stories. And um, it is the stories of the students, I think, that really kind of drive the point home. Well, we had one student, we had a, a few years ago, we had one student who presented with us and a lot of faculty are under the impression that, oh, financial aid pays for their books. So they don't, you know. So, but a lot of students don't fall under that. This was a, a, a returning adult student. She had gone through a divorce, but the divorce wasn't final. So she was still considered, it was like a, you know, the, the both of their salaries. She did a qualify for financial aid. She was a single mom of two. Uh, she and she fell on some hard times, but she didn't qualify for financial aid. And she said to me, "You not making me buy a hundred and thirty dollar textbook?" Like you know, she had friends in other sections of Speech One Hundred and One, who she said they they had to buy a, a hundred thirty dollar textbook. She said, "Thank you so much for not doing that because it really, really mattered. It it really mattered to me." Because she was a returning student, so her priority, she was buying all these textbook and she's, textbooks, and she said she had faculty, you know, who didn't even use the textbook, never referred to it, she never opened it up, and then she couldn't return them, and it was, it was a hardship for her. So I agree with you, Erin, and I think that our student stories are really what's really important to listen to. Yeah, absolutely. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? A lot of good dialogue and discussion going on. <laughs> well, I know Telly and Ryan would be open to your feedback. You feel free to reach out there. Mm -hmm. Please, yes. If anybody has any suggestions on ways that we can move forward, we, like I said, we have right now, we have more questions than we have answers, but we are going to tackle it over the summer. And if anybody is teaching you know, communication speech, and they're interested in being a part of the project. I don't know, Ryan, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I, I kind of I kind of hinted at this earlier, but, and I, I've noticed this with discussions around open education in general, or maybe disruptive educational techniques in general. But uh, for me, one of the most, you know, unplanned, but fulfilling and worthwhile aspects of this is the, uh, you know, cross, uh, or inter-campus kind of collaboration that happens. Um, I get to see what's happening, at, at, you know, at, at Talia's campus and her classroom, how she's teaching it. And just as an adjunct to this, Talia and I have had conversations about our classes that are independent of this project that we wouldn't have had otherwise. So I say, you know, the more the merrier and uh, uh, it's, it's all for the good. Agreed. Yeah, I've, I've stolen a couple of ideas from Ryan already for my <laughs> first <laughs> for some activities and uh, assignments. So it's all good. Well, thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you so much. And please reach out to us if you have any suggestions or comments. Well, thank you both so much for um, being willing and available to share with us today. We really appreciate that. I posted a link to where the recordings will be. It's on the website where you access the link to join the session. Um, I'll get that up as soon as it's ready. Um, we do have more webinars throughout the week at the lunchtime. Um, not full day ones like today, but um, from here on out, it's just the lunch hour. So I encourage you to take a look at those activities. And there are others happening across the globe. Open Education Week is a, is a global movement, and uh, the Open Education website has some terrific uh, listings there for you. So we hope to see you at another virtual event soon. Thank, thank you. you. Both thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And thank Bye. you, Erin, for putting this together. We appreciate Absolutely. it. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye.